our next three talks are about some of the exciting things that are happening with data and computation on data and simulation in, in support of data. So I'm very happy to welcome our first speaker, Carlos Faham. Carlos joined the uh, Berkeley Lab as an Owen Chamberlain postdoctoral fellow last September. He's working on the large underground xenon dark matter experiment, or LUX, you've probably heard of, which recently became the world's most sensitive detector of weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, um, after an 85-day run. Carlos is working on using NERSC resources to improve LUX performance related to computation, storage, and analysis. In particular, he's interested in using a massively parallel database for interactive LUX data analysis and visualization. So, Carlos, thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right, so I, so I work for LUX. LUX, the Large Underground Xenon Detector, um, is a relative newcomer here at NERSC. So I'm going to tell you about what we're going to do, not necessarily what we have done. Um, and there are some exciting prospects for us here at NERSC. So I just want to tell you about something that happened in 1933. It's, <laughs> it's not this, but I just want to put it in context. 1933, this is the malloc. There's a K there that I miss. Malloc machine. Um, it can solve 10 simultaneous differential equations, which, was, which is very nice. Um, and, and of course now, uh, Edison 2014, uh, I don't want to make the Malloc machine self-conscious in front of an audience, so let's just say that it can also do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so now that you have that framework, 1933. This is, this is 1933. Um, this is Fritz Wicke, uh, an astronomer. He, he sparked a revolution in, in thinking. Uh, it was a very long revolution. It took, it took a long time for people to really take his ideas seriously. To summarize that, here's a quote by Stephen Maurer. Um, when researchers talk about neutron stars, dark matter, and gravitational lenses, they all start with the same way. Zwicky noticed this problem in the 1930s, but back then nobody listened. So that's, that was the story of his life. And, and it didn't help that that was his, his favorite phrase. Um, so. He, he was a remarkable man. He, he coined the term supernova. He, he discovered uh, quite a number of them. And he also um, dabbled in, in jet propulsion. I guess you, you did that back then. Uh, he had uh, over 50 patents. Uh, he was, I believe, the first one to propose using supernova standard candles um, and, and many other things. And most importantly, and this is the, the point of this talk, is that he uh, found a problem uh, between a discrepancy between the visible mass that you can see in a galaxy and its kinetic mass, what the equations of motion tell you about how much matter is in there. He calls this dark matter. Um, and since 1933, this has been present in pretty much everywhere you look in the universe. So that was the then, and, and here's the now. We have a wealth of evidence. I'm just going to go through them. I wish I could explain each one right now because it's beautiful physics spanning many orders of magnitude. Uh, two Nobel Prizes here. Uh, see George Smooth here, that's one of them. Uh, Sal Perlmutter. Uh, there is some excitement uh, in BAO uh, recently as well. Um, there, there's a wealth of information, and they all point to the same picture, is that we live in this kind of universe. It's not shaped like a pie, but that, that is, that, those are the ingredients. Uh, this is us, unfortunately. Every, Every so often, we, we get a new picture of the universe, and we just get smaller and smaller in this picture. Uh, so this is us. This is regular matter. Uh, all the particles in the standard model of physics that we know of are here. And this is matter that we, we don't know what it is. We know it's there. We call this dark matter. And this is dark energy. This is something that we, we don't even know how to begin thinking about it. Um, that, that may be an exaggeration, but this, this really is an open field right now. So talking about dark matter, this, this part of the uh, pie, uh, we really don't know what it is. So we want to try to get more fossil pieces in there. So you can try to see it in the sky, what's called indirect detection, if it annihilate, annihilates or does some sort of interaction that it gives you by products. You can possibly see those with telescopes. Um, there's a direct detection, which is, which is lux. We have a big something, some sort of detector here on Earth. And as the dark matter passes through us, we can potentially detect it. And then there is a production um, at the LHC. You could potentially make this new particle and see 
whether it fits the cosmological parameters needed for, for many of, this, of these puzzle pieces. So, so here's a picture, 69% dark energy. Uh, let's not talk about that. Uh, dark matter, 26%, and two, two significant, uh, significant figures, that's 4.8%. And this is some sort of concordance model where many different, um, I'm not going to explain this too much, but there, there is a, a, a concordance between different measurements that, that tell you uh, that this is where we live in, in, in dark matter, to total matter, sorry, and, and energy, uh, dark energy. All right, so how do you detect dark matter? Um, I, I wish I could tell you, but uh, this, is, this is how we're attempting to detect it. Uh, this, is, this is our galaxy, um, uh, Arte's rendition. <laughs> and um, this is all we can see, luminous matter. And you can detect the presence of a dark matter halo, spherical, uh, roughly spherical, around the, the Milky Way. Um, and the solar system is, is moving here. The Earth is moving within the solar system. So the motion of the Earth relative to dark, the dark matter is, is, is not the same. Okay, so you should feel this wind of dark matter. If you could feel it, there will be millions of these particles coming through you. Uh, just like the neutrinos, you just don't feel them. They're so, they're so uh, weakly interacting. So we're assuming that dark matter um, particles uh, are able to interact with our detector, just like neutrinos. And Lisa. He's going to tell you all about neutrinos in the next talk and how, how we actually have this technology that can detect neutrinos. Uh, and we put a detector, and of all of these flux going through it, once in a while, one of it is going to interact with the weak force. We don't know whether it interacts with the weak force. There's a, a lot of theories that uh, support new particles that interact with the weak force that kind of match this need that we have in dark matter for new particles. So let's just say it interacts with the weak force. Let's look for new particles that are scattering. Now, Lux is not the first to do this. In fact, there's a very long history of people trying to do this. This is the uh, brief history of dark matter, uh, direct detection. Here, I'm plotting the year starting in the late 80s. And here, this is the probability of interaction, OK? It's called a cross-section. And we're assuming some sort of mass, because if you have heavier particles, it changes the cross-section. Uh, these terrible, terrible units that we've inherited since then um, of 10 to the minus 40, 41, 42 centimeters squared for cross-section, but just bear with the units. So we started up here, um, Homestick and Oroville. Um, funny enough, we're, we're back at Homestick now for Lux. Uh, and you see this technology going through, the germanium detectors. Uh, then people started thinking about cryo detectors. So cooling down this germanium gave you much more sensitivity. And here is another trend. So you can see that the rate of improvement per year is actually getting better and better. Um, I don't know if there's a Moore's law for this, but there should be, I guess. Um, and then there's the noble liquids. These are the, the, the right-hand side of the periodic table, the, the noble gases that we liquefy. And they turn out to be excellent particle detectors for this kind of work. So here's the noble revolution. There is another kink in the, in the rate as a function of, of, of time. And, and here's where we are right now. We have the, the, the best limit. Uh, so we're the best at seeing nothing, unfortunately. Um, it's a dubious, <laughs> dubious title. But um, if there is something, on the other hand, we'll be the first to see it. Okay. And just to show you what the scale of, of the Lux result is, um, I'm going to pick on the little guy here. Uh, sorry, Oroville. Um, here's Lux one minute. Uh, after one minute of data taking, we had that, that limit sensitivity. Here's five minutes, here's one hour, um, 18 hours. This is uh, CDMS2. Most of, some of you may have heard it. It, it was a very successful program. Uh, it still is uh, running at university uh, here at Berkeley. Um, Bernard Savile, he, he, he did a lot of his work here with people at LBL and other universities. Um, can I use this? Yes. Uh, then here's Lux four days. This is seen on 100. And here's us. Uh, sorry. Here is, I'm going to stop using this. <laughs> Here's us in 85 days, and we're going to, we're ramping up. Uh, we're beginning this year uh, a, a new run, hopefully April, but I don't want to give any dates. Um, a one-year run that will put us here, and we'll see what we can find. So you may have heard that dark matter uh, direct detection is also known as underground science. Uh, there's, there's a reason for that. 
Uh, it's not because of what we call the lure of the underground. It's a New Yorker uh, image. Um, it, it's not really because we want to be underground. It's because we need to be underground. There is this shower of cosmic rays going through you uh, every second. If you extend your hand right now and if you could feel these particles going through you, you'll feel about one per second in your hand. And these are extremely energetic particles. I mean, the, the particles that the, the LHC produ pr <laughs> produces um, pale in comparison with these energies that we're talking about. And when you go underground, you use the Earth as a shield. So you have this massive mile long shield of, of rock. And when you go on the ground and you extend your hand again, you're going to get one per month. You're going to wait for a month or two or three months until something hits your hand. So that makes the, these, these low energy rare event searches possible. If we use our detector here on the surface, which actually we did for calibrations, it is this shower of high energy particles just all over the place. You cannot see anything about that background. Uh, we're very lucky to have a, a, a fantastic facility here in the U.S. Uh, it's in the state of South Dakota, right here. And uh, here's an aerial view from a, from a Cessna. Uh, here is the, what we call the, the, the head frame, the shaft that takes you a mile down to, well, much, much further down than the, the frame can, can see you, can, can, can show you. Um, this is really one mile of cable that just unrolled. I wish I had a, a video to show you, but it's quite, quite remarkable. They just take you with one cable the whole way down and then up again. Uh, and here, the Lux, Lux uses facility. This was a duplicate of the underground layout that we use for commissioning our detector. <clears throat> if there's any fans of the show Deadwood, and you, you, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm <laughs> saying, because this is Deadwood, South Dakota. That, that's right there. You should see that show. It's fantastic, by the way. And here's, uh, here's the Davis Cavern. It, it, it was literally a hole in the ground in 2011, late 2011. This is called Eager Grad Students. Uh, this is to be written, my, mine one of them. Um, and this is uh, a year later, exactly a year later. Uh, this is called Busy Grad Students. This is a laboratory space all finished up, polished. The detector is inside this water tank under our feet. Uh, all the instrumentation in and ready to take data. Here's the the lower level, so uh, our feet were here in the previous photo. And, and here's a water tank that the, it's, a, it's a shield for the detector. Uh, we want to keep neutrons out because neutrons look like dark matter particles in our detector. And here's a nice video that the uh, uh, Harvard Smithsonian uh, Center for Astrophysics and Annenberg Media did for us. Uh, shows you the scale of the detector. Um, unfortunately, we didn't chromate our, our cryostat, but it is roughly that those dimensions. And, and that's a photo that, that we took uh, right before we filled with, with, with water. So I'm a, suck, I'm a sucker for <laughs> animation, so <laughs> excuse my cheesy. Uh. All right. Um, as you can see, we have photomultiplier tubes uh, in there as well. Um, these are photo detectors. So whenever a, a, a cosmic ray particle goes through, it will give off light called Cherenkov light, the same principle of detection as ice cube. Um, and you can detect those and, and veto the system so you don't take data during that time because you can produce neutrons that mimic dark matter particles. Okay, so he, here's how the detector works, and then I'll, I'll tell you more about our data and computation because that's, yes? What's the temperature of the water? Minus 100. Oh, the, the water is room temperature. And the uh, xenon is minus 100 Celsius. Which down there, what is the room temperature down there? That's a, that's a good question. I think it's a few degrees above regular. Uh, the, the rock temperature is much hotter, but they have a huge ventilation system that keeps it just a little above room temperature. Uh, I forget what the rock temperature is, but you, you, can, you can notice it is definitely warm. As you keep going down and down, it keeps warm, warmer. So here's how the dec detector works. Um, you have the, you know, you can almost hug it. It's about this big. It's a, it's a big vat of liquid xenon. It's about a meter in both directions. Um, and you liquefy the xenon. Here's the liquid level. You put photomultiplier tubes. They're photodetectors. They can detect a single particle of, of light. And they're very sensitive uh, devices. So you put 61 at the top, 61 at the bottom, and then you put an electric field with grids. Here's a grid. Here's another grid. There's an electric field that I'm showing here. So any particle that comes in, 
will interact with the xenon, and the xenon is going to do two things. It's going to give you light. It's going to give you charge. You're going to detect the light immediately, speed of light. And here it is. We call that the S1 signal. And then the electron signal is going to propagate in the electric field at a very uh, or relatively fast uh, speed, and then it's going to jump from the liquid into the gas, and in the gas it's going to glow like one of those neon signs. It's called electroluminescence. Okay, and that's going to give you a much bigger signal. So a pair of an S2, which is the electron signal, and an S1 is one event. And the delta T between them, the time, equals Z. So more time is deeper, less time is higher. Okay, and then with the heat pattern, the, 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 the neon light, if I, if I may, the electroluminescent light is very close to the top array, so it's going to give you a hot spot. That gives you XY. So we have XYZ for every particle in the detector. This is very powerful because most of our backgrounds are going to stop at the surface, the skin of the xenon, that, and dark matter is not going to care. It's just going to go in and interact, if at all, uh, in our detector. So we can pick a virtual volume inside where we're looking for a dark matter, and most of our backgrounds are going to be in the, in the outside. So here's a Lux collaboration. This was just before we released our first results uh, last year. Um, if Vicky was around, you'd probably <laughs> say that to us. Um, so here's just highlighting some people. Um, this one is hard to see. I don't know if Gil is around. <laughs> uh, so this is Bob Jacobson, Kevin Lesko, Gil, Gil Chris in the shadows, um, Vic Gaiman, and myself. And these are better pictures of us. Um, and also we have Mia. Cookie Monster. He, she's about to graduate. All right, and we had our first results um, in October 30th, 2013. We had quite a bit of press coverage, which was excellent for our detector. Uh, future, um, we made the top of the Google News Science, which is aggregated, which means there's a lot of references to it, which is good. Uh, Forbes and The Economist, I'm not putting the New York Times. If you read it, you know why. Um, and, and th this was a good time for the experiment. And this is our result. Um, a lot of work put into drawing a line in this parameter space, but th this is quite powerful. Here's the mass of the dark matter in GeV. Here's 10, 100, 1,000. We don't know what it is. You can see that we have no idea what we're doing <laughs> because it spans so many orders of magnitude. Um, but here's a probability of interaction, again, the cross-section. And you can see this was the state of the art in 2012, 2011, 2010, and so on. And we just surpassed them by a good factor, factor of three, factor of two. Uh, down here at low masses, there were some contour plots drawn that you can see. These are signal, people saying we found dark matter. Uh, some of them don't say it very loudly, but that is, that is the implicit assumption when somebody draws a parameter space blob saying there is something here. Um, we ruled those out uh, quite robustly. Uh, we've been saying that for a while, that those don't seem like signal. Um, in our new run, we're, we're probably going to go even, even deeper. But we're very happy with this result. Unhappy that we didn't find dark matter, but at least we, we, we can say something about this, all of these claims um, that have been uh, dubious at best, I think. OK, so Lux data. This is, this is the, the part that ties to NERSC. So we have, we have a lot of Lux data. Uh, this is what the data looks like. Again, this is the S1 and the S2 separated in channel number going from 1 through 122. We have 122 photomultiplier tubes, channels. And the data is very sparse, but it's, there's also a lot of data. Uh, I'm not doing justice here to the amount of data that we've been collecting. Um, we collect every pulse. We don't trigger. We just collect every pulse that our detector gives out. Um, and and you have, that gives you a lot of information. Then offline, we, we chunk it into events like this one where there's an S1 and an S2, and then we, we do analysis with that. Uh, so we have this keep everything, find anything um, model. We, we want to have high efficiency. We don't want to miss dark matter. If it turns out that a theorist had this great idea, and if we could only go back and take that data again with a different trigger. Um, so, so we have an offline trigger. We, we don't throw any data away, none whatsoever. So in 85 days, we acquire uh, 50 terabytes of waveforms. This is compressed data. When you blow it up, there's a, there's a big factor there. And 
and uh, reduced quantities, which is derived values based on these waveforms of 25 terabytes. Um, this, you know, compared to some of the bigger experiments, uh, this may not seem like a lot, but we do keep everything and we want to find anything. So this is a rare event search. Uh, we're looking for wind dark matter, but we're also looking for a lot of different things. There's action dark matter, there's uh, inelastic dark matter, uh, double beta decay in the bigger detectors, coherent neutrino scattering in, in our next phase, uh, and many, many detector calibrations. So we have a data processing chain that we developed. Uh, it takes this, this time series data and spatial data and gives you, you know, the energy reconstruction for each event, the number of electrons and photons, uh, position, height, width, symmetry, uh, a lot of digital filtering that we do, the quality of the pulse, and we call those reduced quantities or RQs. So this is what we do data analysis with, but at the end of the day, you always want to go back to this and make sure that the event made sense. You just want to look at the event. Um, I just want to say that we also do Monte Carlo simulation output. Excuse me, that also gives you this sort of data. We can model the data from the detector directly. It gives you waveforms, and we run those through the data processing chain as well. And just to give you an idea um, how, how rare the event search is, uh, this is all the triggers. Uh, again, we don't throw any of the non-triggers away, but after the data has been collected, this is, these are the things that passed some triggering scheme for the electron signal. And we collected in 85 days, um, 83, 84 million. Um, once you start doing some cuts for a particular data analysis, such as the WIMP dark matter, uh, you pick some energy ranges, so that really cuts down, you know, 20,000. Uh, and then you pick the fiducial volume, the inner region that I spoke to you about in the detector. And that really cuts down to 160 events. And out of 160, there's one that is in our signal region compatible with a, with a wind recoil, but it's really a background that fluctuated down. We, we're not claiming that that's dark matter. So 84 million, one. Um, that, that's the scale that we're trying to, to work with. And every time you want to do a different energy regime for a different event topology, for a different type of dark matter that you're looking for, this uh, changes and it gives you maybe another one. So here are the resources that we're starting to use. Um, we, we're starting to use Carver for, for our data processing. We got an award for data intensive pilot program. Uh, that was, that was uh, great for us. We can get started with this award. Uh, we're gonna do all the data processing and simulations here on Carver and pursue also independently uh, PDSF node acquisition for, for the same reason. Um, then on storage, we're putting all of our data. Uh, we have a full mirror here at, at LBL, uh, at NERSC. Um, all the process waveforms, reduced quantities on disk, and HPSS tape, uh, all of the raw waveforms. And then we're starting to use uh, Globus, Globus Online for transfers. Okay, and um, just to tell you about two exciting projects that we're pushing ahead here at NERSC. We want to evaluate, um, potentially use CIDB for data analysis. We think that this is really going to take the lux data analysis to a whole new level if it works the way we want it to. And, and then an online event viewer. So, so here is the file system analysis model that we're using right now. Uh, that pretty much sums it up for you. That, that sums it up. <laughs> All right, the file system uh, based analysis is, is very difficult for, for data managing purposes. Uh, to find anything is just very difficult. It's slow because you have to go you know, for every file. Um, and the analysis results are not easily replicated. The, the code list on some postdoc's computer, and he did this analysis many years ago. Can you redo it? Well, I have to go through all the data, et cetera. So we, we don't believe that this is a model that's going to that's gonna be uh, best suited for our needs. Uh, I think this, this, sometimes I feel like this. I don't know if you've read this, this XKCD. Uh, you know this metal rectangle full of little lights? Yep. I spend most of my life pressing buttons to make the pattern of light change however I want. Okay, sounds good. But today the pattern of light is all wrong. <laughs> oh God, try pressing more buttons. <laughs> so it, it just doesn't feel like the, the file system um, model is, is the way to go. So we're trying this, this CIDB is a massive database. Uh, it's, it has native array support. Uh, so this is what we, what we use for all of these uh, reduced quantities. Uh, it's a parallel data access, share nothing. So here's our data, here's chunks of data that you're gonna assign to different nodes. 
And when you want to ask something, it just gives it back to you in parallel. And you can do regret operations. You can do uh, many, many operations that are very, very useful. So we want to uh, evaluate that. Right now, we're dumping all of the data into SciDB in a, in a startup account and, and, and see how, how well that works for us. And also, um, if you want to look at an event, let's say you have all these RQs and you have them plotted, you have all these little dots in the on the screen, and you want to say, I want to see that event right there, that little dot. Show me the waveform. Uh, well, you have to look at the event number, then go to the server, download the file that corresponds to that event number, put it in your computer, load it, and then look at it. OK, show me that other event, right? And that other event, so on. So it would be great if we had a browser. Uh, this has been done before, of course, but this will be uh, good news for us. Um, you go to a browser. You go to one of these NERSC portals. Um, Here's the event list. Show them to me. I don't have to get the data. I don't know where it is. I don't have to know where it is. I just know the event numbers. And I want to plot them. Or I'm in a data analysis session right here in, in SciDB. Just show them to me. Just plot them right there while I'm doing analysis. So these two pathways for, for event viewing uh, are going to be very powerful and, and reduce the amount of time we spend trying to get the, the, the visualization. OK, and just want to tell you about the next stage. I have a handful of minutes left. So Lux and Zeppelin. Zeppelin is a UK, a UK collaboration um, in, in Russia and in Portugal and a couple of other institutions in Europe. Um, they have a dark matter detector just like ours. Uh, we're merging uh, the collaborations to make what's called the LZ detector. And this is Lux, uh, 370 kilograms of xenon. And just to give you a sense of scale, this is LZ, uh, the big brother of, of Lux and Zeppelin. It's going to be seven tons. This is metric tons, double N, uh, with liquid xenon. Um, you know, three times, four times as many channels. And we're going to have a lot more data. Surface area, much more background. And we really want Lux to set the stage for LZ. Right now, we're in the planning stages for LZ, this is the, the right time to start looking ahead and into what can be done with you know, parallel massive arrays uh, in a database, visualization, et cetera. So we want to pave the road for LC. And here's the summary. Uh, so Lux is running. Uh, we want to keep everything, find anything. We collect every pulse and then do many uh, different analysis um, to see, to see uh, different topologies. Um, we're starting a new dark matter search very soon. We expect over 200 terabytes of raw data, simulation, and reduced quantities. Uh, we're starting to use NERSC. Uh, all of these resources are fantastic. Uh, Carver, PDSF, G, uh, GPFS, uh, HPSS, and Globus for, for data and, and computation. And we're evaluating some of these massive parallel databases for data analysis. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? OK, well, this is, this is, this is fantastic. And I'll point out that I'm, I'm thrilled to find another Fritz Zwicky fan, because right. ever since I've had a, a, my own uh, machine, it was been called Zwicky. Oh, really? And people come up to me and say, well, who the heck is that? <laughs> you just so get the credit so now the they know. Right. So you, you have those. Uh, big neutrino detectors, uh, you can't use that? You can't combine the two experiments? Or what's the difference between the two? That neutrino, high energy, and dark matter are very, very low energy. Oh. So we have a very low background detector at low energies for these kind of searches. Yeah, it's a, it's a different energy scale. Eventually, we're going to be thwarted by neutrinos. When we get very, very sensitive, we're going to start seeing the low energy neutrino interactions. But well, that's maybe 10 years down the road. So are you, are you talking about like geo neutrinos when you're? Come again? Are you talking about like geo neutrinos? Coherent scattering. Uh, coherent neutrino scattering from solar uh, neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos. Yeah. So I was wondering, you said Lux was going to take data for another 300 days. Um, so yes. can you give me an idea of sort of the time scale? So then after those 300 days, does it keep going or is it? Well, the, something I didn't mention, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question, um, is that this water tank is the Lux water tank. Okay. So that, that, that gives you an answer, roughly, that whenever Lux goes out, LZ goes in. 
In, in other words, Lux won't go out until LZ is ready. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.